The other technique is called the cardiac pump technique. It is for small animals, so any animals less than 10 kilograms and obviously mostly cats. It relies on your direct ventricular compression on the compliant portion of the thorax. And so in the cranial portion of the thorax, uh, it's usually, um, and ventral, it's usually more cartilage. And so uh, again, don't count spaces, but if you take the patient's elbow and you extend it back as far as it'll go, the point of the elbow usually identifies the fourth or fifth intercostal space. And so what you want to do is using one hand, just take your hand and place it on either side of the sternum and then just use that as your compression. And because you're compressing cartilage, it usually allows you to apply uh, quote unquote direct compressions on the heart. Same thing, um, the rate should be as fast as you can go. So we're talking about 80 or 100 per minute. Uh, usually for me, if you're doing it, effectively as hard or as, as fast as you should be doing. Uh, I'm right-handed, so I always start with my right hand. Um, this hand will tire in a minute, so either switch hands or switch persons. If you're going to get tired, you should let someone know if you can, because as you tire, your compressions will be less effective. So um, switching compressors every minute is actually a good thing, uh, so you can continue effective compressions. <clears throat> D disability is after you've uh, assessed that your patient is breathing and does have a heartbeat, then certainly the next thing would be then to say, well, what went wrong and why did this patient get into the condition that is causing you so much concern? And so look for things like altered mental status. Um, hopefully this will be obvious if there's exsanguinating external bleeding. Uh, exsanguinating internal bleeding is a little bit more difficult. Uh, head trauma, spinal cord injury, and absence of voluntary limb motions are kind of quick things that you can assess to see why your patient may or uh, have got themselves into this scenario. Okay, so first slide that if you had anything to remember, to remember this one slide of the other one to follow. So the emergency drug doses, and I think it's great that a lot of veterinary places have a chart um, that tell you of the patient's weight, you just go down and say, what volume of drug do I pull off? That's great, it definitely should be there, but if you're in a practice where you see a lot of emergencies, then um, I know I like to train my nurses to not to have to rely on that chart or a resuscitation chart. They should have a general rule in mind so you can pull up drugs very quickly. And that rule is called the 10% rule. And that rule means that the volume of the drug, so how many mils you pull up, is 10% of the patient's body weight. So super simple. So a 10 kilo dog gets one mil of these following four drugs, epinephrine, lidocaine, atropine, and diazepam. I threw diazepam in there, um, obviously not because it's a common CPR drug, but because seizures are also a common emergency. And so you should be familiar and comfortable with pulling up doses of diazepam very quickly for your doctor. So again, 32 kilogram dog gets 3.2 mils of all these standard drugs. These drugs do come, just come in usually that I'm aware of, of one concentration, and so that's why this one rule follows. I think to challenge yourself, I would uh, go back to your charts, the charts that you guys have posted somewhere, usually in surgery, or where you guys work on your animals, and actually look for yourself, and you'll see that the 10 kilo dog gets one mil of epinephrine, one mil of lidocaine, and one mil of atropine. Your doctor may or may not choose to use that amount, but as long as you know roughly how much to draw and hand it to them, then I think um, that's uh, beneficial. It saves some time. The preferred route is going to always be IV if you have IV access. If you don't, you can double the dose, which essentially means doubling the volume, and give it intratracheally or IT. Diazepam can't be given IT, so I just wanted to um, kind of point out that if you're using the rectal route for diazepam, you should, uh, you can double the dose, uh, or sometimes you don't, sometimes you can give one dose, uh, the, the standard dose rectally, and see what that does first as well. Okay, so indications for drugs, um, it's, it's tough, you're not going to be the person that makes this decision in terms of what drugs to give, it will be your, your veterinarian, but if you kind of know what they're thinking, or what they, um, uh, along the lines of what they should be thinking, it might be easier for you to know which drug to pass on. So um, I did throw this in uh, for a little bit of extra learning. 
Um, and why I did so is also because when an animal is about to arrest, there's really only five common pre-arresting rhythms. And so we're really only going to talk about five things. Uh, it's going to be sinus bradycardia, pulseless electrical activity or PEA, sinus arrest, ventricular tachycardia and ventricular fibrillation. And in all honesty, there's really not much you can do with ventricular fibrillation unless you have a defibrillator. So in the private practice, um, scenario where you don't have a defibrillator, we really only have to worry about four things. Because if the patient fibrillates, then um, they're pretty much sunk. There's not, not much you guys can do about that. So with sinus bradycardia, uh, ECG, I'm going to talk about two things, what the ECG looks like and what the physical exam looks like. Because again, you may or may not have access to an ECG. So with sinus bradycardia, the ECG is normal, where there is an identifiable P wave in front of a larger QRS complex that looks normal, followed by a depolarizing wave or T wave. But there is a huge pause in between each beat. And so um, physical exam or what you can identify on ECG is that you're going to have a slow heart rate with synchronous pulses. So always feel for the pulse at the same time. Um, so for every beat you hear, you should uh, get a pulse. Femoral pulse is probably the easiest place to feel for a pulse. If you, that happens and your animal, uh, your doctor thinks that your animal is going to be uh, about to rest, Basically, the only drug to really choose for or reach for is going to be atropine. So have that ready for them. Gain 20 kilo dogs, 2 mils of atropine. Pulseless electrical activity. ECG, it's very difficult because the ECG can look completely the same as I tried to point this one out as the similar to the last one, sinus bradycardia, where your beats can actually be sinus, meaning that there's a P, Q, R, S, T, and if you were looking at it quickly, and it doesn't have to be bradycardic, it can actually go at 100. Um, if you look at your ECG, you may not be able to actually diagnose this. Um, sometimes you may not have a P wave, but again, with the ECG screen going by you quickly, it may be very difficult to pick up on ECG. But on physical exam, you don't have any auscultable heart and no palpable pulse. And so this really is a physical exam diagnosis. The ECG is basically reflecting the electrical activity of the heart, but it is not translating into mechanical or muscular motion. So it really is just surface electrical activity. And in this choice, you have to pretty, pretty much pull up the whole gamut, which would be epinephrine, lidocaine, and atropine. I put vasopressin in there for a, a discussion to come on a later slide. Sinus arrest, your classic medical doctor show, right? Flatline. It is wrong to pull out the defibrillator for flatline. You can't do anything about um, jump starting the heart with uh, sinus arrest. So uh, defibrillation is wrong. It's um, going to need drugs. So again, physical exam, you're going to hear nothing and no palpable pulses, and your drug choice are the same. If that ever happens where you don't get a pulse and you don't uh, hear a heartbeat, then your choices are always to pull up everything because you're likely going to need them all. Ventricular tachycardia, they're going to be wide, bizarre complexes. So your ECG may look like this, um, where there's no identifiable P wave. It's actually, it's there, it's just hidden in the wide, bizarre QRS complex. Physical exam, you will hear typically a rapid, irregular heart rate. And when you listen to the heart and feel for the pulse at the same time, this is when you're going to get pulse deficits, which implies that you're hearing something but not feeling something. Uh, with a with a pulse. Your drug choice in this scenario then is usually lidocaine, so an antiarrhythmic, and then to optimize your electrolytes. But again, that will be at the discretion of the doctor. And, <clears throat> and then the last one that again you can't do too much about is ventricular fibrillation. ECG pretty much looks like this or trash or um, artifact. You can't really discern anything. Physical exam, it's difficult. There's no auscultable heart, heart and no palpable pulse. So you may think it may be other uh, scenarios that we've discussed about as well. Um, but with this uh, particular arrhythmia, the only treatment of choice is defibrillation. So I always advocate that if you don't know and you don't have an ECG, then you might as well kind of give everything because you may not be in fibrillation. It's just that if your patient doesn't come back, then you can um, surmise that maybe they did have ventricular fibrillation prior to that.